John Anthony is President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, President of the Society for Gulf Arab Studies, and a consultant on the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf States to the Departments of Defense, State, and Treasury. He is an adjunct professor of Middle East Studies at the Defense Institute, uh, Defense Intelligence College, where he teaches a course on strategic issues in Middle East Petroleum. He is an adjunct professor at the Defense Institute for Security Assistance Management. He lectures also at the United States Air Force Special Operations School and regularly on the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf State and Region of World Affairs. He is a past president of the Middle East Educational Trust and a former associate professor of Middle East Studies at Johns Hopkins School of International Advanced International Studies. He is visiting, was a visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School of Government uh, at the Foreign Affairs at the University of Virginia and at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Texas and at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. John received his undergraduate education at the Virginia Military Institute where he was president of the class of 1962. He also received uh, graduate degrees from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University with distinction and at Johns Hopkins University. He has worked abroad in several capacities including director of cultural exchange projects in Iran and Egypt in the early 60s and as a Fulbright scholar in the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen in 1969 and 1970. John has traveled frequently to and exclusively in every country in the Middle East. He is the only American to have been invited to attend as an observer each of the annual uh, annual Heads of State Summit Meeting of the Gulf Cooperative Council. He has written numerous books and articles, among them the Iran-Iraq War and the Gulf Cooperative Council, Goals in the Gulf, America's Interests in the Gulf Cooperative Council. John was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. He is married to the former Cynthia Burns McDonald and is the father of twin sons. I am sure you will find my brother Rat's talk interesting and constructive and lots of questions in the Q&A. John? Thank you, George, very much. The, the phrase, Brother Rat, for those who, for you who don't know what it is and may think, gee, that's a strange phrase. Uh, that's the name of, uh, of one's classmate uh, if one went to the Virginia Military Institute. And so it's an enduring term. Uh, it has nothing to do with being a rat as such. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bird and uh, members of the board and, and guests, um, it's a pleasure for me to be here once again and to see how your membership has grown and you've outgrown your previous uh, quarters. And yet you continue as before to participate in the dialogue and national debate <coughs> about our country's interest and involvement in the world beyond our shores. Uh, the World Affairs Councils and the Councils on Foreign Relations uh, take up an enormous amount of space in the private sector <coughs> of the United States. And your deliberations, your decisions, your recommendations, your participation uh, does not go unnoticed <coughs> by the elected officials of this land and our legislative body and the executive branch as well. So uh, I applaud you for this and I commend you for your participation and ask that you please uh, keep it up. Uh, this particular meeting is held at a very uh, propitious time. Indeed, uh, the winds of democracy continue to blow, not just in the Middle Eastern region, uh, which I will focus on this uh, evening, uh, but uh, particularly through uh, Europe, Central Eastern Europe, and Soviet Union and elsewhere. It's also a moment uh, where, as we speak, uh, we see yet another further brick taken out of the edifice of the bipolar hostility that has characterized superpower relations for the last several decades. And perhaps to a greater extent than at any previous time in these several decades, we see within our reach uh, the dreams and the hopes of those who've dreamed their dreams of a time when international relations would have an atmosphere more receptive uh, to peacekeeping, <clears throat> when the moment would be more propitious for strengthening the organization of the United Nations and other regional edifices. Now, the one particular issue that I'll be focusing on does indeed constitute a true test case uh, for all of these raised expectations and our dreams and our hopes and our vision and our, our policies as well as our positions and our actions and attitudes on international affairs. <clears throat> We're speaking particularly about the Kuwait crisis, 
Uh, people refer to it generically as the Gulf crisis, uh, but I think if one uh, refers to it as the Kuwait crisis, uh, we indeed do not lose sight of the Kuwaiti people and the Kuwaiti territory and the Kuwaiti sovereignty and the Kuwaiti independence and the Kuwaiti and territorial integrity that has been trampled underfoot. With respect to uh, how I would pro like to proceed, uh, I would hope I can go over and beyond and behind some of the, the headlines. Uh, I don't want to uh, repeat that which is generally known in terms of the media, although some of the things I will say uh, will indeed be familiar to a number of you who follow these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. I will go in, in the following um, manner. I would like to uh, reiterate the, the principles involved here because so many uh, say that this is an unprincipled um, uh, affair and principles are altogether lacking here. Uh, I, I'm not cut from that cloth. I disagree with that. There are indeed principles uh, that need to be uh, underscored, italicized, perhaps put in neon lights and capitalized. And then I will go to a list of reasons, uh, reasons being quite different uh, from principles in this regard, but reasons nonetheless being the reasons why uh, people uh, roll up their sleeves, put their shoulder to the wheel, and why they are participating in trying to bring about a successful, early, and peaceful resolution to this crisis. <clears throat> After that, I will try to focus on what I see to be four key issues embedded in how we proceed and others proceed, including our allies, our friends, and our strategic partners as we uh, deal with this crisis in the, the period in front of us. Uh, there are no easy answers, no difficult answers uh, for these questions, but they need to be focused on uh, because so much turns on how they are answered with regard to how uh, we will face the uh, rest of this century in terms of our foreign policy and international affairs. Then I will try to uh, summarize with regard to what uh, appear to me, at least, as one analyst, um, our options uh, for the period in front of us and the options of Iraq in the period in front of Iraq. And I will try to give a definition of what would constitute success in terms of America's national interest as well as what would constitute success with regard to uh, Iraq's national interest. And closing on a note of what happens and what are the implications uh, for our positions and policies if we don't do certain things and what are the implications for our policies and national interest needs and concerns if we do do certain things. Uh, that's a, perhaps a tall menu, but uh, let me begin. And at the outset, underscore uh, the fact that I'm as immortal as anybody in this room. I have my biases, I have my prejudices, I have my shortcomings, my weaknesses, my limitations. None of us in this room have uh, a corner on the truth. Uh, we're all intellectual midgets. Uh, it is as if we have enrolled in a college for which there's no graduation. At best, perhaps, we can hope to obtain a, a series of day-to-day -day incompletes. <laughs> With that as my self-effacing uh, prefatory remark, what are the principles? The principles are four. But before even enunciating the principles, let me state that uh, there are many here who intellectually and otherwise need to reduce all of the forces, all of the factors, all of the phenomena to a single issue and to boil it down, uh, to simplify it. Uh, would, would that it were that life was so easy or simple. Uh, this is not the situation in this regard. There are many who say, don't tell me it's anything other than oil. And there are those on the right and those on the left who say, I will have nothing to do with this crisis, nothing to do with this issue because it has to do with oil and nothing but oil. And there are millions who would end the discussion there. There are others who say, well, let's not underestimate oil, and let's be clear at the outset that there is a major oil and energy dimension to this, but let's not lose sight either of the fact that here is the test case to strengthen the machinery of the United Nations with, with regard to resolving remaining regional and other conflicts on the agenda, and enhancing uh, respect and support for international law. Convincing case can be made in that regard. Others say it's, it's not so much that. It's the unfinished business in the Cold War era that even now we speak of as being the post-Cold War era, and yet we see, as we speak, remaining tensions, remaining doubts, remaining suspicions. Uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union 
on larger issues uh, uh, with regard to our relationship. In terms of glasnost, in terms of perestroika, in terms of the Soviet Union's position and its role in regional and world affairs. There are others who say it's, yes, that, uh, but it's also the international financial well-being, whether you're investors or work the market or have your retirement savings turning on uh, a dimension of this crisis, perhaps it is understandable uh, that one could say, I can't see beyond the financial dimensions of this in terms of uh, material well-being and economic well-being and financial well-being, in terms of monetary policies, fiscal policies, tax rates, recession, uh, depression, and things of this nature. And that's understandable, too. Uh, all of us uh, have needs in this regard. Still others say, no, it's, it's not so much that. It's one's credibility. It's one's reliability as a partner in terms of regional peace and security and stability. And saying what one means and meaning what one says year in and year out with regard to coming to our friends and allies and strategic partners' defense uh, when they have their back to the wall and they're in their hour of direst need. I would submit it's all of these. Each of these is a valid rationale, uh, but it shows how complex and interrelated and diverse are the rationales for what we're doing, and in some cases, perhaps, what we're not doing. But the principles are the following. And one is the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force. This is embedded in the Charter of the United Nations. Discussed and debated, deliberated at length and decided unanimously by all the members of the United Nations at San Francisco in 1945. There's no gray there, there's no shading, there's no nuance, there's no hue. This is a black and white open and shut night and day proposition. And it says nothing with regard to conditionality. That is to say, there are exceptions to be made when a country made you angry, or when you were provoked, or when you were, were stimulated. It says, and President Eisenhower uh, made this position very clearly in 1956 when the Israelis, French, and British invaded Egypt, uh, that we would indeed uphold that as a cardinal tenet of our policy, that we would not ever recognize the acquisition of territory by force. Secondly, there's the principle of the international system as we have it and know it in, in terms of the United Nations with regard to the 159 uh, independent nations, with regard to the status quo in terms of those nations, not the status quo in terms of governments or in terms of politics or in terms of social structure or in terms of economic systems, uh, but the interstatal system status quo. And in that regard, the principle having to do with the perpetuation of Kuwait's national sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. Thirdly, has to do with the restoration of the internationally recognized legitimate government of Kuwait. And fourthly, the release of all the hostages. These are macro principles. It's not to say that it's based on oil or anything related to economics. These apply to Nicaragua and Uruguay as much as they apply to Mongolia and Senegal and Sierra Leone. And it is at this level uh, that we're working inside of the United Nations. And it is at that level that we have been able to marshal the internationally broad-based coalition of support, east and west and north and south, on these issues to date. What are the reasons beyond the principles? The reasons have been less cited because they have to do with certain countries' interests. They don't have a universality dimension to them in every case. Or they have to do with something material, economic, self-interest, group interest, and therefore contentious and debatable. But they're real nonetheless. And for millions of human beings, they are the more important reasons and phenomena that they are addressing and hoping to see resolved satisfactorily in terms of their interest. They are the following. One, to come to this oil situation uh, very quickly here. Four of the six countries that we have gone to defend 
along with some 54 other countries that are participating in this effort. Not all of them militarily, some of them financially, some of them economically, others in the humanitarian self-help and relief dimensions, but more than 54 countries uh, have contributed something in this particularly, particular internationally concerted uh, response. These four are the captains of the team inside of the 13 member nation organization of petroleum exporting countries known as OPEC with regard to the decisions on pricing and production of that internationally vital commodity. Now air is dearer, water is dearer, the earth is dearer, but it would be hard to find a more dear commodity vital uh, to the economic welfare of the human kind on this planet than energy. With regard to what they have in that particular context, these six countries have half of every known drop of that particular energy in the world. And we can be left wing, right wing on this, or environmentalists or ecologists, and uh, come at it from various ways. But to put it at the level of one's automobile transportation, airplane transportation, and bus transportation is to put it too crudely in a double entendre sense of the word. Because it's more than that. It's in this uh, lectern from which I speak. It's in my clothes. It's in this microphone. It's in the food that you had for hors d'oeuvres before we came inside here. It's in the nutrients in the soil in, in Maryland and elsewhere that raise the food that we eat. It's in the pesticides that kept the insects away so that the plants could be grown. It's in Johns Hopkins Hospital and other hospitals in this city at this moment, saving not just somebody's life, but some people's lives with regard to the plastic tubing that's going into their bodies to keep them alive at this moment. And the pills that a number of individuals take during the day and will take this evening in order to get them through a day that have this particular commodity in it and are encapsulated in this particular commodity. We're talking about a life-sustaining element here as opposed to the ordinary negative dimensions that so much of the media ascribe to this for. So let's don't overestimate it, but let's also don't underestimate it here. We have only 2.6 percent of all of this particular known phenomenon in the world. Those who we're defending have 50 percent of it. Therefore, they have 20 percent, 20 times as much as what we have. And yet, of the 159 countries in the world, we're the single largest consumers of this commodity, the single largest importers of this commodity, the single largest wasters of this commodity, and the single loudest and largest crybabies with regard to our arrangements in having access to this particular commodity. We complain about uh, a gallon of gas going up to a dollar and a half but don't complain about a gallon of Pepsi going up by a comparable amount, or a gallon of paint going up by a comparable amount, or realize that of all of the consuming countries in the world, we have the best relationship by far with regard to the pricing of this particular commodity. And so there is this aspect that is indeed central. We get uh, our petroleum production uh, from uh, old-fashioned ways. Uh, we are the world's second largest petroleum producer. The Soviet Union is the first largest. Saudi Arabia is the third largest. The Soviet Union produces somewhere just shy of 11 million barrels a day. We produce under 9 million barrels a day, and Saudi Arabia produces just under 7 million barrels a day. Everybody else is way behind these top three. If we just look at ourselves in Saudi Arabia, for example, we produce all of our just over 8 million barrels a day from some 650,000 oil wells. Saudi Arabia produces its just barely over 7 million barrels a day from just under 700 oil wells. Think of the imbalance, the disparity, the asymmetry in that regard and the implications of that. All of our oil wells produced by pumps and have for a long time. And that's an extra capital cost in terms of the steel and the iron that go into the equipment. It's an extra maintenance cost. And that cost is figured into the final product cost. Not a single Kuwaiti well has got a pump on it. Not a single Saudi Arabian well has a pump on it. Not a single Abu Dhabi well has a pump on it. It all flows by gravity flow. 
Our challenge when we are lucky enough to find oil is unless we have expensive equipment, we can't get it out of the ground. That challenge is when they find oil, unless they have certain kinds of equipment, they can't keep it in the ground. It's all about gravity flow. Saudi Arabia has 53 oil fields. It's never produced for more than 21. 32 of them are on the shelf, rusting away back in the hangar, waiting for Chicken Little to fall from the sky and the balloon to go up. One of Saudi Arabia's 53 oil fields has more oil in it than all the oil in all the oil fields in the United States, Canada, and Europe combined. Its second biggest oil field has half as much oil in it as all the oil in all the oil fields in the United States, Canada, and Europe combined. We're talking about the implications of geological realities in this regard. The average production of an American oil well is 14 barrels a day. The average production of a Saudi Arabian oil well is 12,000 barrels a day. I'll come back to oil if you want to talk about that some more. <laughs> With regard to Eastern Europe, I know many people in this audience are the sons and daughters of people who come from Warsaw, from Prague, from Budapest, and elsewhere. And your hopes have been buoyed in the past year as you have seen the winds of democracy sweep your mother country, your father country. And yet, the successful prospects for economic reform in these democracies turn not marginally, but heavily and directly on the outcome of this crisis. With regard to these being the only countries in the world that can supply those Eastern European democratizing societies with the necessary wherewithal to make their economies hum and have the rhythm of profitability over the horizon. There's already the understanding, the agreement between these East European countries and these Gulf Arab countries with regard to supplying them at the requisite amounts and at manageable prices. Much turns in the balance for Eastern Europe. With regard to the dollar, which at a cash bar we paid this evening, and 158 other countries don't have that currency. This particular commodity that we're speaking of, this petroleum, this energy, is denominated not in Kuwaiti dinars or Iraqi dinars or Bahraini dinars, Omani rials, Saudi Arabian rials, or Abu Dhabi dirhams, but it's denominated, believe it or not, in the American dollar. We're the only people who don't have to go to the foreign exchange line and get the currency of this. Think of the Italians, think of the Dutch, Think of the British, the Swiss, the Japanese, the Germans, and others in their envy of us in this regard. And how key this is to the ongoing stability of the dollar, the acceptability of the dollar, the respectability of the dollar, and the ongoing preeminence of the American financial system worldwide. Imagine were it otherwise, for sometimes they argue that it should be otherwise, because they have stood with us day in and day out when the dollar has been strong, when the dollar has been weak. They've gained with us, they've taken a beating with us. But they know how important it is for us in terms of our international strategic interest and concerns and needs that this continue to be the case. They're fully within their rights to say enough is enough in this regard and we'll have a basket case of currencies or sliding rate of currencies in with the price for a gallon or a barrel of oil will be $20 a barrel. We'll take eight of it in American dollars, but we want four of it in pounds sterling, four of it in yen, two of it in Deutschmarks, the rest can be. Uh, amongst the other currencies of the world. Think of what that would do in terms of turning our economic and financial and monetary and fiscal policies into a turn, uh, turn uh, spin, tail spin. With regard to economic assistance, we pride ourselves from the Marshall Plan and in terms of our charity and our generosity as being probably the most generous people in the world. And I certainly feel that way as an American. They say statistics don't lie. We are the world's 17th most generous people in generosity per capita. As a country, yes, we give more than anybody. Japan is coming up on the inside lane and will pass us soon enough. But who amongst us feels the pinch? It's deep. Who of us is sacrificed? Who of us is gone without something because of our country's foreign to the less fortunate of the world in terms of the percentage of what we have and what we could give. 
So we're 17th. The most generous people in the world are the Kuwaitis. No one comes close. The next most generous people in the world are the Saudi Arabians. No one comes close. The next most generous people in the world are the Saudi No one comes close. And then there are the Dutch and the Swedes and the no come to the United States. My point is that 90% of all of the dollars that we send to the less fortunate in the world beyond our shores goes to only five countries, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, Pakistan, and the Philippines, with Greece soon to replace Pakistan. These countries give annually to 80 of the less fortunate in the world, and almost never, to my knowledge, in more than 3% interest in the terms of 30 years and I have no knowledge of any of those debts ever been called. And therefore, for the most part, they're grants, they're gifts. All of those 80 countries are our friends. They are our allies. They are our strategic partners who now have in their vocabulary, whether it's Swahili or Igbo, things like Graham Rudman, things like earmarking, where we have told these countries that it's not that we won't return your telephone calls. We'll do that. Uh, we're the most deficit-ridden country in the world, and the most deficit-ridden country in history, and charity begins at home. And you've got to stand on your own two feet, and we're sorry. These other countries that I just mentioned have been picking up the slack and then adding to what we've dropped. It's in America's national interest that we not let those 80 countries down. With regard to other kinds of assistance, on issues that we dearly wanted to see a resolution, but proved elusive to our best reach at the level of statesmanship. Egypt, in terms of its signing the Camp David Treaty and being ostracized, being led to be a regional pariah, a political leper for nearly 10 years. Who resuscitated Egypt into the Arab world? Not America, not the United States. It exceeded our broadest reach. It was these countries that we are defending that work day in and day out to reintegrate and resuscitate Egypt's regional respectability in its position in global affairs, so important as it is to Israel, so important as it is to America, so important as it is to the cause of peace. Who brought the PLO in the last three years to renounce armed struggle as the sole means of liberating the occupied territories, or brought the PLO to not only recognize Israel, but to go the extra mile and recognize Israel's right to exist. Most countries don't recognize another country's right to exist. They just existentially recognize it and establish diplomatic relations. But this was important to Israel, understandably rightly, important to America, understandably rightly. We could not deliver that. These countries that we are defending did that. With regard to Lebanon, in many Americans, perhaps the majority of Americans of Arab ancestry are from Lebanese background, a country that for the last uh, 14 years has seemingly uh, died a, a death a minute and suffered a broken heart a second. A rent asunder, uh, standing now on the precipice of at least the greater prospect than at any previous time in 14 years of seeing the notion of a unitary Lebanon that had for 14 years been a myth have the best prospect it has had in 14 years to become a fact. It is these countries that a year ago brought about something known as the Taif Accord, uh, whereby all of the living last elected Lebanese parliamentarians came to Saudi Arabia and stayed for more than a month to re-debate and negotiate and decide the fundamental rules and regulations of how the polity in terms of governors would relate to govern, sovereigns to subjects, rulers to rule. And here we have today the prospect of Beirut, at least, becoming again unified. The news on the way up was not good. One group of the six that was supposed to lay down its arms refused to, refuses to do that. But five out of six is not bad. And there are these transitions in all countries' tri trials and tribulations and travails 
there are many great, great, great granddaughters and great, great, great grandsons in this audience whose great, great, great grandmothers and fathers stood with England during the American Revolutionary War and continued to trade with London and found it difficult to make such an easy transition to a unitary situation in the United States of America. And so Lebanon in this regard is no different. It will need more time and more support and more care and more empathy. With regard to Syria, the enfant terrible, the most demonized in the American media with perhaps Iraq catching it on the inside lane and walking away with the candle and the Heisman Trophy at the end. Who knows that Syria's president has met six times already this year with Egypt's president, who has held true to the Camp David Treaty. Who knows that the Syrians have no comparable arrows in their quiver to play the old game that they used to play with regard to terrorism, regional instability, and prolonging and sustaining the Iran-Iraq war up until several years ago. With regard to Afghanistan, a major success story, but underreported in the American media overall. No group of countries worked closer and harder, more diligently with America to politically and diplomatically isolate the Soviet Union and make it costly for the Soviet Union to insist on occupying the peoples of Afghanistan. These are other issues taking place in forums where we don't belong, we're not members, but we have great interests and great concern that these countries delivered. And these are the countries uh, that we are protecting as well. With regard to the American deficit, to which I made allusion earlier, no single group of countries in the world have contributed annually more to the underwriting of America's national debt. With regard to their purchases of treasury bills and bonds and securities, notes, and how this relates to U.S. government spending and the building two streets down the way, the federal building here, and how this relates to everything from purchasing military equipment to school lunches to paying health benefits for America's senior citizens. With regard to investments in the United States private sector, it is not in their style, either in terms of their tradition or their culture or their norms of civility to pat themselves on the back, blow their horn and take credit for this. Uh, but they have pumped billions into the United States economy and therefore touched the material well-being of millions of Americans and added to the overall corporate vitality, vitality of America and help to augment the state and local t tax revenues throughout this country, and help to lower the per unit cost in the defense and telecommunications industries. There's a gain here, there's a need there, there's something at risk, there's something to be protected. With regard to other regional organizations, the Gulf Cooperation Council is not widely known in America, many don't know if it's animal, vegetable, or mineral, but it's essential to our mission. There's not a single American soldier, sailor, or air person uh, who would deny its vital role in smoothing our mission at the present time. Or previously, especially during 1987, 1988, 1989, 89, when we were bringing to an end the last vestiges of this century's longest war between two states in terms of Iraq and Iran, and how they flew their planes above airplanes to protect airplanes, and how they in the process protected not only their own people but tens of thousands of Americans and American investments and American institutions all the way from Kuwait to Oman. Or how the people of Bahrain, maybe some of you remember when I was here before, it was not long after that, that an Iraqi plane had hit an American ship, the USS Stark, on May 17, 1987, and 37 of America's best and brightest died. More than 100 would have died had it not been for the Bahraini Navy going out and saving our sailors who otherwise would have drowned, right 
under Iran's nose they did that. And the Bahraini ruler going into the hospital in Bahrain and asking his own citizens in the burn units and wards would they mind being evacuated to make way for America's men and women. Or what Oman did with regard to saving 37 pilots who otherwise would have crash landed in the sea. But Oman said, despite just being seconds away from Iran, come here and land here, be safe here, you have a solemn here. Or even the peoples of the United Arab Emirates going up in our helicopters together, and their sharpshooters and our sharpshooters shooting the mines in front of the American ships going up and down the Gulf. Almost none of the media covered what I just mentioned. Or if they did, it was on page 67, and most papers don't have 67 pages here. In that regard, in the Gulf Cooperation Council, inside of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, four million barrels a day were taken off the uh, uh, market when the UN pronounced its embargo and sanctions against Iraq. Who brought the four million back? Not us. No one in our hemisphere except Venezuela to a degree. Who brought that about? Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, call for an emergency meeting of that 13-member OPEC group, even though inside it was Iraq, even though inside it was Libya, even, so, even though none of them wanted to meet, and all of them wanted to see the price go through the roof. But they called for the meeting nonetheless, and small as they were, outnumbered as they were, outwitted they weren't, and they prevailed. And they got the agreement to raise the production, four million barrels a day. And so the balance between demand and supply is the same as it was on August the 1st. And no one can blame them for what is in the realm of anxiety, fear, and anticipation with regard to how high the oil price has gone. If that is not responsible action and reaction and behavior, I don't know what is. And taking it politically and diplomatically on the cuff and the guff in the process. With regard to Afghanistan, it was their leadership role inside of the 46th member nation organization of the Islamic Conference. Many remember the name of someone called Salman Rushdie and how we found that so audacious and outrageous that a head of state could call for the head of an author, no matter how repugnant and unsavory and despicable perhaps the message was of what was written and what was published. But 45 of those 46 countries disowned what Iran did, rejected, renounced, condemned what Iran did. But did our media pick that up? I think most Americans think that all 46 Islamic countries stood on an issue like that. With regard to the League of Arab States, this is the world's oldest regional organization. Many people think of Arabs as oil wells, not as countries, not as uh, prayer heirs and legatees of a rich civilization that has contributed to our own culture far more intensively and extensively than I think most Americans are aware. There's this gaping hole in our knowledge as to what happened in universal history from the fall of the Roman Empire until the Renaissance, uh, this period that's uh, nearly a thousand years when the language of commerce and trade and technology transfer and investment and mathematics and algebra and the invention of the zero and cornea transplants and metabolism studies and retina detachments and navigational studies were all in Arabic and this aspect of it with regard to the League of Arab States, 22 countries that are also crucial to us politically and diplomatically and strategically at the present time. 12 of its 22 members voted to send forces and otherwise contribute to the multinational force called in the wake of the Iraqi aggression there. So these other organizations, we're not members in them, and yet we have immense interest and involvement at stake. Very quickly, what are the issues and the policies? There are four, as I see them. One is an economic one related to energy. And the issue is this. Is this particular vital, depletable, scarce international commodity that is so vital to the well-being of us all on a day-to-day -day basis to be harnessed for the peaceful, evolutionary, economic development of humankind? Or is it to be harnessed to the dictates and to the whim and the expansionist militaristic aims 
of a single head of state, a single country. We have no answer to that, but this crisis embeds the answer within it. Secondly, with regard to dispute resolution on the remaining conflicts on the globe, at the regional level in particular, are these disputes to be resolved peacefully or forcefully? And all that turns on in the realm of diplomacy and third parties and good offices and arbitration and mediation and conciliation. We don't have an answer for that. But in this crisis is embedded the answer. Thirdly, what about the credibility of the United Nations? If the United Nations does not persevere and succeed and see that its principles are upheld in this open and shut black and white case, what will be the United Nations credibility for the rest of this decade and beyond? And then lastly, what about America's credibility? Many people think that we just reacted at a whim or Pavlovian response or trying to show that one wasn't a wimp or one could be decisive or one could act with dispatch or that their days of being weak and weary and wary and withdrawing from international commitment and responsibilities carrying over from Vietnam had to be put decisively behind us. Few, less than 1% are aware that we have been practicing for this for 18 straight years. In 1972, we did a survey of the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula at the request of those governments to come up with an assessment, an analysis as to where the threats over the next 20 years would most likely come from. And we concluded that they would come from the north, precisely from where they've come, or where there's also a challenge. We were asked to come in and build the bases, the facilities, the infrastructure to prepare for that rainy day. One thing led to the other. We began to have our faces fit with one another, comfortable with one another, trust one another, extend a confidence with one another, willingness to take a risk with one another. And so we began to train with each other, separately and jointly. Thousands of Americans have trained for what we have been going through in the last three months. Tens of thousands, really. And thousands of people on the Arab side of the Gulf have also trained. Away from the limelight, away from the video cameras, away from the media. But they trained nonetheless. They exercised. They maneuvered. They procured air equipment. They overbought in order to preposition so that it would already be there. We wouldn't have to take it from Baltimore or anywhere else on the East Coast. And it would be there for decisiveness and dispatch. This is another aspect of it in the sense that throughout, and indeed dating from 1951 through President Truman, saying that America would always take seriously any threat to Saudi Arabia's national sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. In effect, we said throughout, if in trouble, dial 911, and we'll be there on August the 2nd. According to the game plan, understandings here and there, practice over and over and over and over and over, they dial 911. What would this say about America's credibility? What would this say about peace? What would this say about justice? What would this say about law? What would this say about order? What would this say about the vision for the rest of this decade? if we were to have turned our backs on our friends to whom we gave our word, to whom we said what we meant, and we promised that we meant what we said. There's no answer to that, but the answer is embedded in this crisis. Our options and Iraq's options very quickly. Our options are to stay the course, show that we have the stick to that we have the necessary public patience, the requisite national resolve and determination to hang to the sanctions. Secondly, we could attack because we conclude that the sanctions won't work. Thirdly, we could compromise or settle or negotiate or deal. These are our options. Iraq's uh, options are 
following. To do nothing, uh, not to budge, just to scorn the UN, defy international law as some other countries in the region have done very successfully in somewhat comparable circumstances. It could attack. If not the United States, it could attack Israel. It would love to do that. It would love to change the formula in terms of the constants and the variables there and make this, instead of an Iraq-Arab world war, an Iraq-American war or an Iraq-Israeli war with an American dimension to this. There are some Israelis who would welcome the scenario taking place. Or, thirdly, Iraq can withdraw unconditionally. What is success for us and what is success for Iraq? Success for us is the total unconditional withdrawal of Iraq from Kuwait, the release of all the hostages, the restoration of the internationally recognized legitimate government of Kuwait, and a significantly constrained, restrained Iraq. What would be success for Iraq? Pursuing its political strategy of trying to divide us, weaken us, wear us down, weight us out until we give up and give in would be one. And its military strategy of bluffing and huffing and puffing about what it's going to do to us if we move against Iraq. And thirdly would be to withdraw unconditionally. What would be successful in Iraq in that regard would be for Saddam Hussein to continue to survive. And also success would be to continue to remain in Kuwait, where he is. And both game plans cannot succeed, and therein lies the challenge for vision, for leadership, for decisiveness, for judgment, for will. To end, if we do not succeed, We know what this will say about American will and the will of the world community. There are at least 75 countries watching very closely and carefully what we do and how this evolves. Secondly, if we do not uh, persevere at the present time, it's not a question of whether any of these other 75 countries will move against their neighbors because they too want a, a mountain or a river or a stream or a resource that's not in their borders. They too have a grudge to settle. They too say their borders are unnatural. It's a question of when. And each will say that, don't get on us for doing this. We're only doing it the way you set a precedent in 1990 or 1991. And if we don't do it now, when it's difficult enough, but we have certain advantages, then there are many who believe that certainly we'll have to do it later. When will we at a greater disadvantage? Because we're facing a country that has proven chemical weapons capability and utility, and a coming nuclear weapons capability, and a nearer than one would think biological weapons capability. Now that's what's at stake if we don't do anything, if we don't persevere, if we don't succeed. And inaction or less than adequate action has consequences just as action has consequences. If we persevere and if we succeed, there is a chance like there has not been in this century for an improved international environment and atmosphere with regard to the pressing issues of peace, security, and stability. An atmosphere that would be laced with the moment that's propitious to establish a setting that would be less tolerant of aggression and intimidation. An atmosphere that would hold out the promise for breakthroughs in terms of arms control. Arms control is not part of the vocabulary of this region yet, but it would have to be inclusive and it'd have to be equitable and mutually arrived at by all of the countries in the region, guaranteeing security that has been elusive for all of the countries in the region. 
Now, many refer to this, finally, in terms of Germany and Czechoslovakia in 1939. And people say, if we were to appease, we can hear even now the tap, tap, tapping of Britain's Neville Chamberlain's Kagan and his saying in giving in to Germans' Lebensraum, living room motives vis-a-vis -vis the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia that we have peace in our time. We're dealing with another Lebensraum here. And the analogy in the reference point is not Czechoslovakia, it's not Germany, it's not Sudetenland, it's not Hitler. The reference point is 1935. It's Italy and Mussolini. It's Ethiopia and Haile Selassie. It's the League of Nations in Geneva. It's Haile Selassie going to Geneva when Italy had invaded Ethiopia and saying, in effect, isn't there anybody here who will stand with the weak against the strong? And his query was met with deafening silence by one and all. And it was a straight shot from 1935, Italy, Mussolini, Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, Geneva, to what happened in 39. And this is where we stand. It is a defining moment. It is a seminal issue, a seminal crisis. And I know in your studies, uh, and you're working uh, with the public and with students and scholars and specialists, uh, you will make a difference. Uh, President Bush has done his best to inhibit uh, debate in Congress and the public about the uh, Israeli, uh, the uh, Kuwaiti crisis, as you call it. I'd like to know your view of the importance of inhibiting debate and what are the implications for our alliance if we um, quash debate. Yes. Uh, the question is that President Bush has done his best to inhibit, inhibit a debate on the crisis and uh, w also in the, the Congress and what would be the implications uh, for this if this uh, continues. Um, I guess it's the difference uh, between the question and myself uh, of a perception here. Some people see a glass half full, others see it half empty. Others curse the darkness, some light a candle. Um, in my case, um, I come from the latter school, and I believe that there uh, has uh, certainly been uh, extensive debate. Uh, who can say what's sufficient, what's adequate debate? Uh, we just went through the um, biannual elections there, and all of the American people had uh, ample opportunity to uh, make this an issue, make this a statement, question the candidates. But we see in poll after poll and analysis after analysis that despite the opportunity being right there, it wasn't, wasn't taken. Uh, so it, it wasn't for lack of opportunity. Uh, with regard to other aspects of the debate, well, the Senate and the Congress uh, has been out for a, a fair a portion of this uh, session since the uh, crisis began, both in August and in September, running for re-election, and uh, they're out at the present time, and in many cases, uh, too. So we haven't had uh, a, a bare quorum uh, to be debate this, although it is being debated. There will be hearings uh, coming up in the, in the next uh, three weeks, and uh, therefore one can stay tuned to this. More than that, uh, there hasn't been a Sunday when uh, there hasn't been uh, Webster, Cheney, Baker, uh, uh, Colin Powell, uh, Vince Scowcroft, and Sununu on almost every one of the networks opening themselves uh, for questions and answers, et cetera, to try to inform. Uh, but I would be the first to uh, say that if we are to judge the debate either in terms of substance or format or extent in terms of how well Americans understand why we're doing what we're doing, by that standard, it's clearly been insufficient. Most are confused. And I hope this evening some of us are less confused. Thank you.